This presentation is all about negative feedback. And specifically, we're going to be looking at um, the kidney and how water regulation in our blood is an example of a sort of negative feedback loop. Negative feedback is a process that hopefully you have already come across um, in various different areas of the biology course. So hopefully it's not a completely new concept to you. But for those that are less sure or can't quite remember um, what it is, negative feedback is where um, a change in one direction, i.e. away from the norm, results in a change in the opposite direction, restoring the norm. I.e. if we think about um, body temperature, the norm would be 37 degrees. If you have a change in one direction, so you get too hot, if you get too hot, the body will then have corrective mechanisms that will mean um, you end up cooling down, which is um, essentially an example of it um, changing the opposite direction, i.e. you were initially getting hotter, now you're getting cooler. Or perhaps you were getting cooler, so the change in one direction, i.e. your temperature is reducing, the results um, of those corrective mechanisms is you end up sort of increasing your body temperature back to the norm, restoring the norm. This diagram here just shows that again, but we've now got a few of the key terms that you need to be using when you're um, explaining and um, what negative feedback is. So first of all, homeostasis. Homeo meaning the same, stasis meaning state. We must make sure that we always maintain the same internal state Otherwise, our enzymes will denature and um, it can be fatal if we don't maintain homeostasis. If there is a change away from the norm, so that might be your body temperature increases or decreases. It might mean your blood glucose levels have increased or decreased, for example, after a meal or after exercise. Or it might be to do with water, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Perhaps your um, water potential of your blood, i.e. The, the sort of concentration of free water molecules in your blood, might increase or decrease away from um, the sort of stable state that is required. Now, that change is going to be detected by receptors. The receptors um, will send information to the control center, which is, in humans, our, our brain. The brain will then bring about a response um, bring about those corrective mechanisms via the effectors, which will correct that imbalance and um, ensure homeostasis is achieved, that same internal state. Now, the example you need to be aware of with respect to the kidney is the regulation of, your, um, of the water potential of your blood. There are kind of two areas of the brain that you really need to um, be aware of here. Firstly, the hypothalamus and secondly, the pituitary gland. These are going to be really important. The hypothalamus is responsible for detecting the water potential of your blood as it passes through the brain. So it's like monitoring the water concentration. The pituitary gland is known as sort of a master gland. It's really, really important. It, it manages the other glands in your body. Glands release hormones. The pituitary gland is going to be responsible for releasing a really key hormone that we'll look at um, today called ADH. Now, um, there's a lot going on in this slide. I just want us to focus in, first of all, on the bottom half of this diagram. So I'm just going to zoom in here. This bottom loop shows us what happens when the blood water potential is too high, i.e. you've got too much water in your blood. If this happens, the hypothalamus, that really important area of the brain, is going to cause the pituitary gland to release less ADH, less antidiuretic hormone, ADH. As a result, less of that hormone, ADH, is going to travel in the bloodstream to the kidneys. So the walls of the collecting ducts are going to become less permeable to water. What this means is less water will be reabsorbed into the blood from the nephron, which means more water is going to be lost from the blood body, i.e. you're going to have a larger volume of dilute urine produced. So the sort of overarching picture here is if you have too much water in the blood, you're going to end up needing to go to the toilet and do a massive wee and that wee is going to be really dilute. That's the kind of big picture. Just to go through um, the other half of that graph then. 
This is the opposite situation. So this is essentially if you're dehydrated, how is your body going to conserve water if you're dehydrated, if the water potential of your blood is too low? Well, first of all, the hypothalamus is going to cause the pituitary gland to release more ADH, more antidiuretic hormone. Therefore, more ADH is going to travel in the bloodstream to the kidney, where it makes the walls of the collecting ducts more permeable to water. This means more water is going to be reabsorbed into the blood from the nephron. So you're going to have less water being lost from the body. You're going to end up producing a really small volume of urine, and the urine that you produce is going to be more concentrated. Now, hopefully um, that all makes sense because um, here we have these correcting mechanisms that enable us to regulate our water potential of our blood. Whenever our blood um, water potential gets too high, the corrective mechanisms bring it back to normal. Or if it gets too low, the corrective mechanisms bring it back to normal. Because of that, this can be um, a really good example of negative feedback in your body.